Okay, thank you for joining us. I'm Maddie Feeney, and it's my pleasure to in introduce our three authors who will be discussing sex in the age of Instagram. Daisy Buchanan, pouring water right now, <laughs> is the author of a best selling novel, Insatiable, and the non fiction books, How to Be a Grown Up and The Sisterhood. An award winning journalist and broadcaster, she hosts the chart topping literary podcast, You're Booked, and has written for every major British newspaper and magazine. Megan Nolan, in the middle, is the author of the best-selling novel, Acts of Desperation, which was selected by The Observer, New Statesman, Irish Times, iPaper, and Stylist as a book of the year. She's a columnist for The New Statesman and has written for pub publications from The New York Times to The Guardian. Born in Waterford, she now lives in London. Anisha Dolan is the author of Exciting Times, which was long listed for the Women's Prize and the Dylan Thomas Prize, and shortlisted for three further awards, including Waterstones Book of the Year. Nisha was also shortlisted for the Sunday Times University of Warwick Young Writer of the Year Award in 2020. Born in Dublin, she now lives in London. Could I ask one of you to open water? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask questions for about 40 minutes, and then I'm going to open up to the audience. So put your hand up with anything you'd like to ask, and people will come with microphones um, so we can hear you properly. Um, I'm sure the authors would love to hear everything from you. Um, and at the end, they'll be signing books outside in the lobby and copies of their books are on sale at the Waterstones pop-up. Okay, let's kick off. The central relationships in your novels share a power imbalance where the narrator's low self-esteem and idolization of their partner or partners leads her to accept a exploitative treatment that makes her unhappy. Why did you want to explore this dynamic in fiction? Who'd like to go first? Megan? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for, for me, what you talk about um, had to do with the feeling of like not, my narrator doesn't feel like a real person, I think, and struggles to um, feel like the weight of herself in the way that she perceives other people to be real. She doesn't feel that she has been realized and I think the way that she relates to Kieran, the man that she's in love with, um, has to do with trying to make herself realized in that way. Um, and that, you know, that means that she'll do, any, do anything and sacrifice anything to, to um, f have that feeling of realization. And, um, you know, she obviously tries to, to do that in different ways as well with drinking and with other ways that she treats herself, but that's the love one is sort of the the most um, pleasurable and addictive for her. Yeah. So I think that's what leads her to behave in that sort of self uh, self destructive way. Yeah. Um. What about Ava? What What do you think? I think probably what was driving the initial decision mm. was that. I wanted to take some of the escapist or fantastical elements of novels, but see how it played out. So the sorts of partners that Ava is drawn to combine various traits that novels have often fetishized. But I wanted, having taken that degree of fantasy, to think realistically about how such people would be likely to treat her and how it would be likely to make her feel, given her position relative to them. So then I suppose mechanistically how that ended up working was it was being true to the characters as I saw them. And I, I think that's often how I work. I start with half asking myself a question about fiction, but instead of following it through its theoretical conclusions, I just throw them in a sandbox and let it pan out. That's so interesting. What, do, what about Violet? How, where, where, where did she spring from? Well, I must stress, Insatiable is not autobiographical <laughs> in terms of what Violet gets up to. <laughs> but my biggest memory of my 20s and the time when I felt the most vulnerable and the most anxious, I was so desperate to give my power away and so frightened of taking responsibility for myself. And I guess part of the story came from that, the fantasy of, you know, well, wouldn't it be lovely to have someone who just sort of tells you what to do and you follow their lead, even if they are awful? And what I hope happens to Violet is that she learns how to kind of take the power back by, you know, being exploited. And it's so soft and so seductive. And, you know, with Lottie and Simon, the couple who sort of take her under their wing and other things, um, 
everything about their world, it's just so, so soft and so comfortable. And it's about all of those comfortable things. I think when I was in my 20s, I've never been poor, but I've been very broke and very, very scared and always been in that place where like your towels are damp to the touch and you turn the water on and it's never, ever going to get warm enough. And everything's just a bit pinched and stretched and doesn't quite meet the edges. And that Violet, you know, thinks she has her price. She thinks that, you know, she is willing to let go of all of her autonomy, you know, for this sort of lovely you know, luxurious world. And she does get very excited about, you know, the the hand soap and the candles. And then over the course of the novel realises that actually they're not as valuable as she hoped they'd be. Uh, but there's a book I really, really love uh, by Jane McKinnery called Story of My Life. And that's about three young women in New York. And they're much wealthier than Violet, but they're as reckless. And it's set in the 80s. And before they all go out, they all say to each other, can't rape the willing, which is chilling, you know, to 36-year-old me. But to me in my 20s, I remember that. I just remember, you know, drinking whatever I could get my hands on and saying, we'll see what happens. I am, you know, I'm out of office. I'm off duty. And I think that that's how Violet gets herself into those situations. She has consented to it before she consents to anything. And then it's about her learning why that's not the best idea for her. Yeah, like you throw yourself in and then you have to withdraw. And I think money plays a big part in um, in Ava's relationship relationships. Can you talk about that a little bit? I suppose that stems as well from that impulse to hold the romantic up and make it answer for itself. So I think especially when it comes to her male partner, Julian, mm one could say that she can't really like that he's rich because she doesn't like anything that comes with it. She doesn't like that he's unavailable to spend time with her whenever she wants. She doesn't like that he views other human beings as disposable. She doesn't like that it's ultimately the biggest thing in his life, being someone who is rich. But she likes the money itself. So I suppose because she's at a point in life where that's pretty much the ubiquitous truth that you're confronting everywhere, that you're beginning to make decisions and accept the things of trade-offs, I think relationships are one of the several situations in the novel that make her ask, does she like money and everything it comes with? And does she like other things and everything they come with, like emotional intimacy, for instance? Mm. Um, Okay. Online, we present a carefully constructed persona while analysing others' activity on multiple platforms, from Instagram to dating apps. Everyone's performing and pretending not to look at one another. How does this duality, as we move between online and offline selves, affect our self-perception and our love lives? This is a really painful and (laughs) challenging question. Um, I I was not single in the Tinder times, but I know so many people who are. And I think that what we forget, we talk about, oh, isn't it awful? Oh, you know, we're all selling each other short, we're all so miserable. I think we've got to acknowledge that what it is offering us is very attractive and very exciting and it's so immediate. And I think that, you know, for all of us, but for for women especially and, you know, people who sort of grow up and are socialised as women, again, it's it's a tiny bit of power when we have so little power. And I think that, you know, sort of plays into sexuality too. Um, Something that is a little bit autobiographic about Violet is she was... um, brought up in a very sort of strict religious household and she's always been told to be a good girl and secretly wanted to be a bad one and wanting to know how that feels and you know I think that's for online we can do that we can throw off everything that we've been told to do and we can experiment and that can be a joyous wonderful exciting thing but that can be a miserable thing also and then the other thing is we have that the judgment and we judge ourselves and we judge other people and I think we don't always know that we're that we're doing it that we can be quite sort of sneery like I'm sure I've got a few friends where I'm like, oh, you're very naked on Instagram all of a sudden. That's a lot of you. I don't want to judge. And yet there's a bit of me. And then you find out like, oh, God, they've had an awful breakup. Something has happened. And they're doing this because they're insecure and they've lost sight of who they are. And they just want to feel sexy and beautiful. And we can't begrudge anyone that at the same time. We've got some serious dismantling to do when it comes to the fact that what we consider sexy and beautiful is so narrow. Um, But, you know, I think that 
we've all got a little bit of internalized misogyny that we're we're sort of we're reckoning with and I think that we're all way, you know, women are sort of, we're told to be sexy and beautiful, but also to change the standard. And it's a lot of weight to carry. And I think that if you want to lose yourself online, experiment online and create your persona and curate your persona, I, you should have the freedom to do that. And I will try very hard not to judge you, even if you are my pal and I've just seen all kinds of things yeah. I wasn't expecting to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, Megan, I wanted to ask you about um, your narrator's obsession with Freya, mm -hmm. um, who is the sort of on-off ex of Kieran, um, the, uh, the narrator's new boyfriend. Um, talk a little bit about how that plays out. Yeah, so my narrator has a fixation on photographs of this woman who has been a sort of overbearing presence in her relationship with Kieran, and she never meets her, and that's part of why the obsession becomes so dark, is that, you know, if you see someone in real life, they're a human being, and it can help you, you know, pr have some realistic perspective on things. And Frey is this sort of dream girl who lives in a different country, and who st stands in for so many things that threaten my narrator. Um, and one of those things is, it's not just that she's beautiful, she's a particular kind of, um, you know, cool, beautiful, and she's very uh, sort of androgynous and hard looking and uh, in, a, in a very appealing way that threatens my narrator, I think, because she sort of uses her vul vulnerability to appeal to people, I think. You know, she, she sort of makes a, makes a meal of how, um, of how open and soft she supposedly is. Um, Anyway, so I think that that's part of what spurs her obsession with Freya. Um, and then I can't remember if I specify like wh what how what app she was looking at, if I said Instagram or whatever, but obviously that was um, the, the implication was that she's looking at her photographs on Instagram constantly. Um, and I think, you know, uh, <laughs> I definitely had a period of that in my earlier 20s when you, you, you really just shouldn't have the power to look at all your your, your partner's ex people, you know, and and I wish I didn't have that ability. And mm -hmm. and when you first discovered that ability, it seems so powerful to consider yourself in relation to them. And when you don't have a stable grasp of your own identity yet, mm. it's very fascinating to, like sort of endlessly fascinating mm. to think about what your partner values in you and, and in these people. And, you know, it, it, is, just, it is just fascinating. Mm. Um, and obviously now I'm a bit older, I have more restraint, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, a lot of us had had that. Yeah, and when you're hurt, you're kind of t turned back to that drug. Yeah, and there's no end to it. You know, there's always mm. going to be a photograph to look at, even if you've seen it a thousand times, and you know, analyze and mm. try and compare yourself to, and yeah. spin a story around. Mm, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nisha, speaking of stories, um, in your novel Ava, Ava and Edith seem to do a bit of cat and mouse with the viewing of Instagram stories. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that plays out? I think that's perhaps an example of how Instagram is a tool rather than a preordained outcome because they do get probably quite competitive about signalling that they're less interested than the other party while trying to gauge the other party's interest. But equally, Ava and Julian manage to do that largely in a non-digital manner. And it's true that Ava projects wildly onto Edith's Instagram, but she manages to do that with Julian despite his having a minimal online footprint. So. I'm inclined to think that while Instagram and its cousins might intensify behaviours that we would conduct anyway if offline, simply because there's more data to interact with, um, the predisposition to those behaviours is there regardless. So it'll come out some way or another. That is exactly my next question, <laughs> which maybe we don't need to do now. <laughs> um, your, your books feature honest depictions of sex and desire. We've come a long way since Sex and the City, but is society still uncomfortable with nuanced and diverse representations of female sexuality? And how do you approach writing sex scenes, Daisy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I partly mm. wanted to write it because I wanted that. I wanted a horny heroine. Um, I grew up reading Jilly Cooper and Jackie Collins, and I'm a huge fan of those books. And what I love so much about those books, Jilly Cooper especially, is you see, I think, very human, vulnerable women who worry about quite boring things. And 
then you you see them having that sexual triumph and really enjoying themselves. And, and you know, it feels I mean there are people probably make more puns in her books than they do in um in regular sex. Or or maybe I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. But um <laughs> Other than that, you do, you get that moment of, of wanting and hope and triumph. And yeah, I think that we never stop talking about sex, but we're quite negative about it. And as you say, there's that lack of, of nuance. And I think that, you know, there was a lot, especially lately, that sort of felt quite dark. So yeah, when I started writing, I was like, I want, I want horniness and I want yearning and I want fun. And then as I wrote, like three women came out, um, Luster by Raven Leilani, which I thought was spectacular. And it felt like a real thrilling, sexy moment. Um, and I, you know, I do believe that we and also we need to sort of make it a bit more tactile and normal. Um, I think there's always a mor moral panic about pornography. The trouble is that so much of the porn we see it is very sensational. There is, you know, all sorts of porn out there. And, you know, it can be shocking and uncomfortable. It can be, you know, loving and thrilling. But that is sort of, it's all less clicky. So, and I found that, you know, when you write a very sexually explicit book, um, you know, people do clutch their pearls a little. I'm really, really hoping that what I've done is to show sex is a big part of the human experience because I mean I was very like I wanted to be quite explicit and I've always been you know quite a um, an enthusiastic fantasist um and I definitely had I think when I first sent it to my agent I thought oh, she's gonna fire me <laughs> but luckily she was um she's on board she's a pervert too but <laughs> I was a bit taken aback by how taken aback people were, to be honest. I thought, you know, surely this is, um, you know, it's the 90s, guys. It's not <laughs> the 90s, it's <laughs> 2021. But, um, yeah, I think and maybe being a woman writing it as well. I mean, I think it's, in a way, maybe it's easier for me. Maybe I've got more freedom. I think that people are, you know, have quite a complicated relationship with men talking about, sex and um I, I had a frog in my throat then it sounded like I was embarrassed about <laughs> saying sex <laughs> at the sex panel um but also you know I can talk about you know what feels powerful I could talk about what feels vulnerable and you know it's sort of a softer space to slip into oh god I've got to stop making <laughs> innuendos <laughs> yeah because I think I think what you have in your book is it, it is a real celebration of sex and it's and it's exciting and then but then also she has to learn to re redraw her boundaries and what both of your books have in common is that they are sort of coming out stories as well they are sort of queer love stories um can you talk a little bit about the kind of i suppose the the journey of sexuality that Ava goes on yeah so one thing I find interesting about reception of my novel is I don't think there's a particularly large amount of sex directly no. depicted in it. No. And people are always speaking to me as if there is. Mm -hmm. And I think one reason for that is that of the small amount of sex that we see, some of it is between two women and doesn't involve phallic penetration. And so it is viewed as more salacious inherently. When I think actually there are probably more scenes where the heroine directly goes to the supermarket than has sex with her girlfriend. So I, I think it shows that we have a way to go with having an expansive and fair understanding of what constitutes mm. sex. But in terms of the journey, I think to the degree I did depict sex, it was for that emotional function of showing her very on edge in one scenario with the man and then being able to open up a bit more with the woman. And it was important to me not to do that in this utopian way that people sometimes fetishize um, a female on female sexuality that in the end forecloses all sorts of discussions that we need to have internally about how those dynamics can go wrong. But that was her particular character tra trajectory. And I think that's because the second thing was linked to accepting an aspect of the character herself that she was unable to until she was in that scenario. So I was hoping it made sense for that character to find that sex um, more pleasurable and relaxing without implying that that's necessarily and always the case for everyone in that case. Yeah, and I think you did. <laughs> Megan, anything to say on, on sex? <laughs> um, <I don't> <laughs> that's broad, I don't yeah. know. Um, yeah, no, just uh, when, when you had um, 
when you're asking if you know we have a way to go mm. i was thinking about like um because obviously mm, chatting about sex is f fine broadly culture you know like nobody is going to you know get really mad at you for saying that you have sex as a woman anymore but I think people struggle sometimes with um, with with allowing themselves to take it seriously. Like I think it, uh, there's a lot of um, enforced comedy when it comes to it, and when you try to talk about it being meaningful rather than something silly or um, a bit rude, then people can sometimes get a bit um, a bit embarrassed on your behalf or or for themselves and. Also, I think that sometimes when, you <laughs> when you're interested in sex, as I am, and write about it quite regularly, um, people sometimes get mad at me because they think I'm bragging, basically, that I have sex. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, a lot uh -huh. of men who get mad at me online are mad because they perceive women to be able to have sex easily, mm. whereas men struggle to have casual sex as easily as I would if I wanted to all the time, you know? Um, and I find that a, a sort of interesting conundrum when I'm trying to speak about these things where I'm, I'm not trying to show off that you know we're all adults and it's not a, an achievement to offend someone who wants to have sex with you but I do that's that's sort of the main bad uh, dynamic that I've encountered when people get mad at me for anything I've written that's so interesting there's a kind of resentment about Definitely, that there's, yeah. there's still that it's just a fact isn't it that it is easier for women yeah that's yeah that's so interesting and there is actually there was something um that I'd love you to unpick a little bit with, um, in the book when you talk about uh, desire being authored by men mm -hmm. and, um, and how, how, how you say, um, we're all agreed that uh, people talk about female sexuality more now and that's a step forward, but people, people get really angry if you suggest it's authored by men in any way. Can you talk a little bit about what, what, that, what that kind of means? Yeah, I guess I was thinking about like the time in my life when I was pre-sexual and you're sort of taught to have crushes in a way before you actually have them. Um, and I think that dynamic continued for me well into my 20s, is that I was I was behaving in a way that I, I sort of perceived that I should be behaving rather than being able to listen to my own mm. desires. Um, and, you know, that, that sort of... Uh, I mean, the obvious one, which I think we'll come to later, uh, is, is about... Pornography, obviously, all the mainstream pornography that you see in, in the big free sites, like you porn or those sorts of ones, Pornhub, um, they're all going to be mostly from a male perspective. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's nothing to, to have that be your main experience of seeing pornography. Most, you know, mostly we're not stumbling on queer or women-made pornography when we're 15, 16. Um, so, yeah, I think that I did really struggle to... To real to have any understanding of what I was interested in sexually for quite a long time. Mm. So I think I'm going to jump to the porn question, which which we which <laughs> we which, which we've touched on. Um, how do you think the mainstreaming of porn has affected millennials' expectations of sex, bodies, and gender relations, Nisha? I suppose it's difficult to say because I think we tend to discuss porn as an isolated cultural entity when its content is informed by what the makers of that porn perceive people to want, obviously, which will largely be informed in turn by what porn has done well previously, but also by all sorts of other cultural factors. So I find it somewhat frustrating sometimes when we take porn aside from the rest of it, when actually if you examine the gender relations depicted in general media, it seems perfectly logical that that man and that woman would then, in a separate film, or if we followed them home in that film, go and have that kind of sex. But because it's all feeding things. I think I, I'm uncomfortable making any kind of direct causal claims, mm -hmm. but, but I... Like porn is a reflection yeah, of, our, of our culture. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but then I suppose equally, maybe porn is more potent than other cultural forms because sex is relatively private and difficult to constantly practice with real people all around you unless you're extremely hot but I'm um, not being at that point myself <laughs> I talk to people probably more often than I have sex <laughs> so even if films show women and men talking to each other in fucked up ways I can go and have normal conversations with people and hopefully correct some of that whereas I think sex partly because it doesn't happen as often partly because it's private and partly because there's still I think a huge amount of cultural difficulty with saying what you want and asking someone else what they want. And so 
maybe there's more ability of something that's vaguely instructive as people see it to come in there. Mm. There's a scene in Insatiables I really wanted to include by Violet remembers seeing porn as a teenager and it's her friend who shows it to her and the teenage friend, it's another, you know, they're teenage girls and they go into um, the friend's brother's bedroom and she's like, oh my God, I just thought, like, isn't this disgusting? Isn't this the worst thing you've ever seen? And Violet sort of can't take her eyes away from it but she's like, oh yes, it's, it's, it's horrible. Um, I'm so upset. This is just like vile but then, you know, can't stop sort of thinking about it and thinks about it when she masturbates and I think that we all respond to such a broad range of stimulus in so many ways and sometimes I think what is as, you know, we, that we talk about is poor and damaging. What's also very damaging is the way that we instantly are so judgmental when it comes to what turns us on. We can't really have that conversation at all. I remember at school, you know, we're talking about people would sort of brag about, you know, pe other people wanting to have sex with them, um, you know, coming back to your point. That's, but that was what I was taught for sure. It was much more important to be the sort of girl or woman that was sexually interesting than someone who had desire on her own. And even though a lot of the, the first porn I saw was just so, you know, objectively clumsy and, you know, it was not going to win any cinematography Oscars, mm. um, it was just so different and thrilling. And I think, you know, the way I was brought up meant that, you know, any sex at all, the, the shock and the novelty of it was quite exciting. And I, I suppose I worry about the fact that we, we see so much now, and I think there are upsides and downsides. I think that one of the things that made sex so exciting for me, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested in it, is because, you know, I'm not, not quite old enough to have had to have found all my porn in a hedge, but that was kind of the vibe. And, you know, there, are, there have been, um, this is the awful, I was gonna say, there have been lots of studies, like I have read newspaper pieces and items about separate studies um, and I couldn't name them specifically which is bad of me but a general sense that you know younger people report sort of feeling less desire having less sex having more anxiety and I think as long as everyone's having as much or as little sex as they want to be having in a cheerful and consensual way that is wonderful but I do worry that it's just we know we've lost our interest in it and we've lost that way to be free and feel desire and it's become clinical and performed and scary and what you know porn does is you know doesn't make it easier for people to think oh well maybe I just won't bother rather than having the headspace to explore desire and own it and think about what turns you on <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, I suppose what's r what's interesting about it is that it has changed the, ac l the level of access to porn has changed massively in in our lifetimes and and will continue to change I suppose with with the internet so when even just the generation before us just just it was just grubby magazines and girls probably didn't see them as much and yeah when I've seen sorry to interrupt but like you know old porn and like you know sort of mm. late 60s early 70s play but I mean my goodness you know they were not many 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 problems but you know these women have bodies like you could see you know glimpses of cellulite and the odd you know crop of pube and it wasn't all taut and shiny and symmetrical and spherical and glossy and now on adverts, people, you know, gleam. You can watch a shampoo advert that looks ruder than late 60s porn. But, yeah, I just, you know, I want to see women with, you know, not super shiny hair mm. and, you know, bodies that just look like human bodies. I think we mm. are in danger of forgetting what a real... I don't want to talk about, you know, real bodies because I think whatever aesthetic choices people want to make happen. But there's... um. I know that um, Linda Evangelista heartbreakingly has talked about having a procedure that sort of wrecked her professional opportunities and her self-esteem also. And I think, my God, if Linda Evangelista feels inadequate and not beautiful enough, mm. we're all doomed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, although, although your protagonists resent being patronised by older, richer sexual partners, they also sometimes relish this dynamic. They sometimes enjoy degradation, but feel guilty about being bad feminists. Where do these conflicting feelings stem from and leave women? And Daisy, if you could. 
Um, there is this, actually, when right before the book was coming out, there's a scene where Violet has an encounter and it's she does not fancy this guy at all. And he's the oldest and most problematic guy and she gets off on it. And I think there's something about really not caring about him. She unusually does feel like she can experience a seed of power and she's almost entirely relaxed. She's not worried about pleasing him because all she's got to do is show up. And I think until really relatively recently you know all if you were a young woman who didn't have any money beauty and sexuality was pretty much all you had and we've all grown up seeing that in different guises you know you see it in MGM films um in a really subtle way and now I think there's been a bit of a rug pull and it's very good that we're not offering ourselves up and selling ourselves out all that we're starting to realize that might be a problem but I think that we do need to sort of make allowances for the fact that we've had so little power and free, you know, even like economically, it's re only like quite recently that we've been in the workforce relatively. Um, I really, really loved uh, the short story Cat Person and I thought it was just so brilliantly captured the way that she, what she was getting off on having sex with this guy that she found unappealing. She could see her being appealing. And I think we can apply the male gaze to ourselves. And if you've grown up with, you know, bits of porn and, you know, and also in, in film, I think we've got to talk about the fact that, you know, porn isn't, you know, as um, I think Nisha was saying, it's not isolated. It's throughout our culture, sort of, you know, those values. We see them everywhere. And yeah, I think that, rather than push it away and say, oh, you know, I'm such a bad feminist, how can I? We need to acknowledge where we've all come from and that if that gets us off, it's part of our heritage. And that, I hope, I found it really liberating, you know, if I'm, I'm not doing it, but I am writing about it and I'm writing about it in a way that I found exciting, even if in real life I'd be like, no, that's a, um, that does not sit with my values. <laughs> Um, Megan, so um, there's a scene um, uh, quite early on in the book um, when she talks about uh, when some various one night stands she had, and then the fact that kind of her youth is her is her is her currency, and and she feels that really strongly. And then she goes home to with a with a man, who, an older man, and then and it turns out he's got a really grand house. And then she's like, I'll never, I'll never, I know I'll never see him again. Um, can you talk a little bit about those power dynamics? And yeah, I think as you say, Daisy, that there's only um, you know so many things available to you as uh, as a certain kind of woman and, and if especially if you don't have a lot of money it, it it adds another element of power dynamic obviously but um but yeah i mean i think for me when so i dropped out of university when i was 18 or 19 and then i was very broke for a long time and then during that period you know it was my obviously my early adulthood and I, there was a brief window of maybe two or three years where i was I was like young enough for that to be of value. And it is such a brief time, really. Like by the time you're in your mid twenties, some people will tell you you're, you're, you're past your peak of being attractive. Obviously I don't believe that at all, but <laughs> but like it, there is only, there is only like so much time when it feels like everyone agrees that you, you're, you're, you could be beautiful then. And um, I'm, I'm phrasing that really badly. I just mean that, okay, so sorry, I, 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 read, th I read this, um, who I read a John Updike novel recently, and he's talking about some really over the hill woman, and then it turns out that she's twenty six, and the you know, <gasps> oh so that, 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 okay. that's what I mean basically is that mm. the the actual uh, like uh, universally agreed upon time that a girl slash very young woman is beautiful is brief if you take it to its worst extremes, and I think that when I was in that brief window, it felt powerful that I could at least have that over others over a man who was patronizing and who made money that I thought I would never see and, you know, had had uh, cultural capital that I didn't have. And, and I, you know, I knew that it wasn't a lot, but, I, but at least I had the ability to attract people sometimes. Mm. And, um, yeah, so I think that's what I was getting at with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, and your narrator also seeks kind of, um, like, she, sexual violence. Um, and... Uh, she and 
Oh, who's the guy at the end? Who's Reuben? Yeah. yeah. She she and Reuben say like, oh, they're per- perverts. Um, can you talk about a bit about why you decided to in- include that that kind of desire in her? Um, I think because there was something that I, I needed her to have um, a desire that she wasn't able to fulfill with Kieran for for the for the story to work for for um for her to begin to cultivate this secret inner life that she kept away from him mm. whereas initially she was desperate to kind of give him everything show him everything you know reveal everything about herself to him um and this happened to be a desire of hers that he didn't share and so it, it was it was sort of um imp- important for that to have a life of its own and for her to change from from that um but also yeah i think um there's there's nothing wrong with the fact that she enjoys a certain kind of sex at times but um but I suppose she, 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 because she keeps it secret and is ashamed of it to some degree, the violence that you know she does consent to uh, doesn't always express itself in a healthy way. You know, she because she's ashamed of it. It's not that it's wrong for her to engage in a BDSM practice, mm-hmm. but the fact that she feels shame about it means that it it's not expressing itself in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and oh yeah, let's move on. Um, <laughs> uh, do social media and other cultural influences put more pressure on young women than young men to couple up? And does this make it harder for women to know what we want and to ask for it? Nisha? I think the pressures exerted are definitely quite different. So to take the narrow example of performing couple them on Instagram. I mean, I, I'm very little ensconced in this, but my understanding is if one is a female influencer, one will do a soft launch of the boyfriend with like start, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a, a photo of maybe two passports and a hand that's a bit gnarly to be hers and then like slowly scale up. Whereas <laughs> I feel like a man introducing his girlfriend on Instagram would probably go straight for the bikini shot. But... <laughs> I, I'm unsure of the nuances of this as um, much as I would be fascinated to learn. Not fascinated enough to enter that community, <laughs> probably, but <laughs> I'm fascinated enough to want to find out some other way if I could. But I, th- I think it's another case where I'm uncertain how much media has much of an effect beyond amplifying our worst impulses. Mm-hmm. If you look at the financial tenability it's never been easier not to be with a man as a woman or or suddenly not in the kind of context that we're talking about Mm. so uh, psychologically what's going on that it's still such a keenly felt pressure and i i suppose to make a conclusive answer we need a controlled experiment where half the world did not have instagram but had all the prevailing (laughs) economic (laughs) and social conditions i think they would be happier i don't know (laughs) if they'd be happier on this particular issue though (laughs) i think that even now a single woman freaks people out i think that when you are in a couple you're a solid unit and people can think i don't have to worry and also you're not going to do anything you know, shocking or exciting or wild because, you know, the box is ticked, you know, you're sort of, you're in the arc, you're secure. And when we see single women, even now, their potential is so thrilling and their freedom is so giddy-making. There's that New Yorker cartoon I love. I think it's a Ros Chast one. And it's the adventures of Lady No Kids and a woman talking to, I think, a, a couple who've got a kid. And this woman in like knickerbockers and a top hat saying, I'm just going to follow that goose and see what happens. And we don't want women to follow the goose. And I think this is an old idea that we are shaking off, but it does still persist. And, you know, exactly as Nietzsche was saying, I do. I think that um, the Internet doesn't make us good or bad. It's as good as the people on it. Um, I mean, also, I think that if we're feeling chronically insecure and there are so many things to be insecure about to perform your relationship on Instagram it's a way to say look someone loves me I'm okay I'm validated Um, I have been single and I have spent most miserable Sundays of my life Um, it was Facebook then like everyone like honestly it wasn't everyone but it felt like everyone is engaged everyone's at a wedding here I am alone 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 forever Um, now I'm I've been married for, oh, six years next week. Um, I was trying to work out the timing. And I just, 
I don't really look. I don't. I very rarely share any details of my relationship online. I'm really, really happy and I'm really chill. It's seeing what other people are doing in their careers and their exciting work achievements that make me chronically <laughs> insecure and obsessive. And that's when <laughs> the internet brings out the worst in me. But yeah, I think that... Um, and it comes back to that question of power and the idea that when we have so little power, one of the things that we can do as a woman, in theory, hypothetically, is maybe attract a mate. And that doesn't mean that we're having the sex we want to have or the love that we're worthy of or that we're happy. But we can still, you know, perform this and show this. And we're still being presented coupledom as the ultimate prize. And I do think... You know, as we've said, it's becoming easier to reject that, but it's still got a pretty firm grip on us. Yeah. And Megan, your narrator definitely has worships at the altar of love and kind of kind of al always had. And wh where, d where did you take that from? Was that was that a sort of personal em emotion of yours or sort of like yeah. a blown up version of, of yeah. my experience? So she's she's more dedicated to to her obsession yeah. than I was. But yeah, I think I didn't really understand until my mid 20s that that you could have a good life without being in a relationship because mm. I had never had been single really for my whole, you know, since I was a youngish teenager I'd always been dating someone pretty seriously mm. so I think um I think I'd literally I, I mean I, I know it sounds ridiculous but I quite literally didn't understand you could be happy and have a nice time mm. if you weren't either pursuing or with somebody mm. um and you know then then <laughs> sort of following that logic ended so badly that that I <laughs> that I was forced to learn that you can you know um because because when you have a really traumatic relationship that ends, you know, the alternative to be alone is is a relief at last, you know, mm. it, and it's a different feeling than uh, than I than I assumed it would be. I thought I would be terribly lonely all the time. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think um, as I said briefly earlier, I think that thing of sort of being taught how to have crushes is a big reality, you know, and and that. <laughs> I mean, things as facile as pop songs and stuff that you listen to when you're a very small child and films. And, you know, I think those things did have an impact on me and made me think that the narrative of a relationship was the crucial narrative of life. Totally. And and at school, I mean, I went to an all girls school, which has its own set of problems. Mm, but if, if, if you yeah. if you go in as a teenager, like this, it's kind of. It's what everyone talks about, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. and at university, and, and when I think about university, it like that the pursuit of love feels like the main event, and the pursuit of work feels like, <laughs> a, like, a, like a side show. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we uh, had a gardener, and we were so short of men to fancy <laughs> that everyone had this real crush on this. Um, Fairly average gardener. <laughs> He'd drive yeah. around in a sit on lawnmower. Yeah. Like, it's so dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> Desperate times. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, final question, and then I'm going to open up to everyone. Uh, how can we improve self-esteem in younger generations? Are there ways we could regulate social media to benefit the teenagers of tomorrow? Any ideas? <laughs> All from the floor. I mean, I'm sort of instinctively against the idea of regulation about, you know, in, in that regard. Mm. I don't think you can help someone's self-esteem by, mm. you know, I mean, you can't forbid pictures of m more beautiful women than you or whatever it might be that makes you feel threatened. Um, but I think, I think like mm, there's a, r w when I was a teenager, which, uh, you know, was the mid 2000s, obviously things in Ireland were much different than they had been in, in my, say, my mum's um, experience of growing up in Ireland. Um, but there was, in my community anyway, a kind of um, failure to tell us about the multiplicity of options in every way, like work-wise and life, you know, the way you can, you can live. And I think that that's the main thing I, I think about when I think about self-esteem or, mm. you know, is the, is the ability to recognise that there are so many op options and... Mm. You know, I, I don't just mean, oh, you don't have to go to university, although that is actually one I think I should have been told. Um, but, you know, that that y it's not one trajectory and that, that suits everyone. And and I think that would have helped me. I don't know how you would teach someone that, but <laughs> but I think that understanding that would be would have been crucial for me. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I've been watching the documentaries about the Spice Girls and the anniversary and the formation of the band and seeing that footage and seeing those interviews brought back to me just how narrow, um, as Megan was saying, how constricted everything was. And I think that now social media is daunting and there are some really toxic bits and things that make us all miserable, but also there are parts of it that are so inclusive um, it's easy for me to say this now because I'm not a teenager, but I feel as though I see so much sort of sex positivity, so many different bodies. I hear from so many different parts of the LGBTQ plus community. You can really, really make it vibrant. And I think that's what we want to hear, not it's bad, don't look, shut it down. But just to say, look, this is something that we can all curate and we can vote. And the more that we follow the good stuff and there is good stuff that there are so many activists who are using it as a really expressive and positive platform and yet especially when we're talking to sort of to younger people about how to make it work for them I think we need to give them space to sort of say like look how how does this make you feel can you work out you know at what time you're unhappy what what sort of mood are you in when you're driven to pick your phone up what's making you have the habit there is a behavioral um, expert and writer called Shiru Azadi, whose Instagram is fantastic. And she talks a lot about habit change. And what I love so much is she says, our greatest problem, if we want to change anything, we tend to say, no, don't do it. Have willpower. You're bad for wanting this thing. And the very first thing is just to say, well, why do we want it? Because in the short term, this is meeting a need. How can we you know, be very compassionate with ourselves and curious and explore what we need and then look at a place to get that that might feel a little bit more nourishing. Yes. Any thoughts, Misha, about yeah. social media? I'm inclined to think that the harmful aspects that the youth are exposed to on social media are reflective of values that they'll see elsewhere in the dominant culture anyway, perhaps not in the particular instantiation that they might find on TikTok, whereas elsewhere on TikTok, there's a lot of stuff that they're not getting at all. Like, mm. I, I think there's so much helpful and inspiring and just meaningful information out there that I wish I had had access to at that age. Like still, I'll come across TikToks, not physically on TikTok because I'm not pathetic enough to be there well over the average age, but <laughs> I'll come through them on some <laughs> other format. And I'm like, I'm learning something from this brilliant 16 year old with good dance moves. Like, thank you, brilliant 16 year old with good dance moves. So that's not to say that teenagers will automatically have the critical thinking to tell the wheat from the chaff, but the mere presence of the wheat is a huge improvement over my adolescence. Like, mm. when I was in school, my best friend cut my hair in the bathroom, and by the next day, it was just ubiquitous in our year, the perception <laughs> that we were sleeping together. I've no idea why. I think the word scissoring got lost <laughs> on the wire somewhere. <laughs> but point being, that was the attitude at the time, whereas yeah. my little brother was involved in... an in a charity in Ireland that goes around to schools giving talks called Shout Out about LGBT stuff. And of course there were some problem cases, but by and large he was like, the kids are all right. Like a few years on, they have a way better grasp on the stuff than we do. So I, I think of course harmful messages will still reach people, but platforms where it's not costly and you don't need a huge amount of clout to get your perspective out there, I think will tend to favor progressive messages compared to virtually every other source of information like I think the main thing that I wish my teenage self had known is just that you can always say something later but you can't take it back after it's said like when I think of my main social media regrets it's not looking at other people's stuff it's just all the oversharing and mm -hmm. disclosure and just all that and I wish someone had just told me that if you desperately need to say it a year from now, it, it will still be there as a fact about you that you can share. So <laughs> I think that's probably what I'd advise more than filtering content. Mm. Maybe people are more conscious of that now. Um, okay, well, that was really interesting, everyone. <laughs> Who has questions? Are there any questions? Um, put your hand up if you have a question and then someone will come to you with a mic. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Is it working? Okay, I'm pretty mm. loud as a New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I am so happy that I came. This is so interesting. And I just, my name is Allison Havey, and I, I've been doing sexual citizenship to students since 2012 here, teaching kids in an age appropriate way since 2000, well, about sexual defenses, mutual respect, mutual consent, and have, have, how to have a literacy about how online pornography and social media are influencing you. And I can tell you in the world of RSC, there are very well-known authors and organizations that say, do not watch porn. And I'm not going to tell kids what to do in the privacy of their own room. As far as regulation, I would say, I'm thinking of launching a campaign on behalf of the RAP Project, RAP Raising Awareness and Prevention, my company, about no air brushing on Instagram. I think that wouldn't be a bad idea. It's not regulating, but it's honesty. But what I... And I'm going to buy your three your books. But what I'm getting, and I hope I'm right, and there's obviously a different amount of uh, erotic sexuality in your books, yes? What I would say, speaking to young people, is um, they've lost the sense of discretion and erotica. And not everybody, but hardcore pornography, right, is the polar opposite of erotica, which is whisper, touch, dance, when I was a teenager, I was all about Henry Miller and Anais Snin, and they don't have that. They've got the hardcore porn, not everybody. So I, I always speak to teenagers about the, please use your, your erotic muscle. You know, Remember to think and don't always get off on porn. Porn has the, pro the goods and the bad and the ugly. But you know, use your imagination sometimes to get off and work that muscle and remember that we are complex human beings with erotic natures. And I, th I feel so passionately about them understanding this because I worry. I'm much older than you guys, so maybe I'm being crazy, but that's what I do. But I, I cannot r wait to read your books. And if you're appealing to young people and you're talking and describing beautiful erotic scenes, then I can't um, I keep going. <laughs> Write more, <laughs> more and more. Thank you Thank so much. You. I actually wanted to ask you something back. Do the t it sounds like you have s you do such interesting work, and do you feel like the teenagers you work with are are worried themselves? I get well. I get questions like, <laughs> "It's the kid. It, our work is very informed by what they say. So, how am I going to learn about sex if I don't watch porn, <laughs> honey? T Twenty years ago, we didn't have online porn. Mm. Fumble." which is actually a very good website for young people on sexuality. Fumble, <laughs> that's what the cave people did. It still works. <laughs> Find out. And uh, I'm scared of getting with, a, with someone in case they accuse me of sexual assault. Well, mutual respect, mutual consent, mutual pleasure. If you have that, then it's not gonna happen. You know, know the person. Hookups, you, mo you know, False accusations are like 2%, so it's not a regular scenario that guys get scared of. Um, but I think that they are curious about the erotic conversation. I think that they, I, I, I want them to read more mm. erotic literature, but you know, they're online and not many, I, I don't know. But yeah, I think that they're open to it and they love talking about it because as you said, Daisy, it's part of our cultural reality pornography. Mm. You know. They talk about the guys at Harrow talk about pornography like you and I might talk about Vanessa Redgraves at the National. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't, but I mean, I'm a little older than you. <laughs> this actually plays into a conversation we had just before, isn't it? About about what's sexy and how le the suggestion is is more is sexier than full full display, and perhaps. Um, and a book can be sexier than a film that puts it all out there. So, and I completely yeah. agree. And I just, you know, I want yearning. I don't think, now every single thing in our lives, we can press a button and it's there. It's like, you know, you, can't, you shouldn't have porn as Uber for orgasms. And I don't want that. I want there to be wanting and waiting. And that I think that comes back to the question about consent because you can talk really positively about consent if you've got yearning and craving and wanting and horniness. And... Yes, mm. just so great. Um, and I know, you know, what I heard, you know, as a young woman growing up and navigating it, you know, no means no. You know, you must be very clear when no means no. But I want yes to mean yes. Without shame. 
Absolutely. Does anyone else have a question? Hi, the back. How your experiences have played into your creating your characters. Um, but your characters are characters, they're not you. So I just wondered if um, your characters have taught you anything back and what was the experience of of kind of filtering those experiences through their lives? Great question. Who'd like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Friends to <laughs> get <shy. laughs> um, I think for me it was quite a nice process because I was um, able to have her heal in a way that I hadn't necessarily or 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 you know I I was able to suggest to myself that she she was ha she was going to come out of it in a certain way that felt better than the way I came out of things that had happened to me so it was it was it was kind of it was kind of a nice cathartic process for me in that way to have her ha have her have realizations a little bit earlier than I actually did you know and and you know hopefully experience things a little bit kinder and softer than I did so that, that just felt quite pleasant, really. Michelle? I think probably what writing Ava made me think about most was the layers of, uh, for lack of a better word, um, interpretation that go into not only reading a book, but creating it. Because I was conscious of the distance between how she saw other people and how I saw them, and then that weird in-between space of how the novel sees them. But the novel in this case constituting entirely what the narrator, at some level of abstraction, is saying. So it was a constant challenge to keep that gap going. And I think what it ultimately told me was that when writing, I can't be mindful of what people are thinking about me personally, because it's an obnoxious um, tendency I think when authors try to make it too obvious that they are smarter than the narrator or that they know things that the narrator doesn't and it's so distracting so I just had to let that go I had to let Ava say things that were ridiculous or unfair or over hasty in her voice know that some people would think this was me and be fine with that because I don't have to meet them and if they did meet <laughs> me they would realize that I'm not a neurotic 22 year old I'm just neurotic <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think Violet definitely made me more courageous. And I wrote that book at a time when I felt I could, you know, revisit some sort of vulnerable memories and, you know, bring those and you know, bring those feelings back. But I definitely was aware of how um, I think I've got a real reluctance to sort of, you know, own my actions and, you know, not be... I think this might be another question for another day. Um, there's something quite obnoxious about myself that I've learned about sort of self-deprecation and privilege. Like I'm a woman who has been socialised to sort of put herself down as um, as a way of, of speaking and talking. But, you know, because of the privilege that I have, know that like, oh, I'm perfectly safe because there are other people who come along and advocate for me or advocate for sort of who I represent. And Violet, comes to realise that her, you know, giving her power away, she has more privilege than she knows, more responsibility than she realises. And actually, it's quite feckless to just give that away, that she's got to advocate for herself and she's not life's perpetual victim. She's really got to, you know, she can actually do something, you know, good in the world, be a force for the positive if she learns how to advocate herself and sort of in, engage about. And I think... Um, I always need reminding of that, that, you know, rather than be like, oh, no, I don't want any power. I just want to sort of, you know, if I always putting myself down, then people come and speak up for me. Like, no, that's, it's a grown-up thing, I think. It's about learning a little bit of resilience. Um, and I think Violet's better at it than I am, but I hope she's got more to teach me. <laughs> Well, that is a great place to end it. Um, thank you so much for coming and for the great questions. Um, and can we have a big round of applause for our amazing authors? <laughs> it's been so much fun.
Um, please do buy copies of their books if you haven't already. They are on sale at the Waterstones pop-up shop and the authors will be signing books after this. Thank you, everyone.